Chapter 19 Two weeks of bed rest cured Lisa's fever, but her cough lingered. The audition date was fast approaching, so despite Mrs. Cohen's reservation, she assumed a modified practice schedule. The week before the audition, Lisa skipped her Monday evening practice and went to see Johnny in the hospital. Johnny, pale and visibly thinner, had been confined to his bed and the head nurse told Lisa that her visit would have to be kept short. He smiled when she approached and she kissed him on the forehead. So are you ready? he asked. For what? she joked as if she didn't know that everyone was counting down the hours to the audition. What will you play first? The Chopin. I have a request, Johnny said gravely. When you play the Chopin, will you think of me? Only if you give me another poem, she teased. Johnny put his head back slowly, closed his eyes, and began reciting softly. Tell me, what does God hear? I have despaired of prayers with words. All of my prayers are your music. Lisa took his huge hands in his own. Of course I think of you, Johnny. I only wish I could play it for you right now. You don't have to. All I have to do is close my eyes and I can hear it. Lisa kicked him gently and left. With three days to go before the audition, Lisa was little good to Mrs. McRae or Mr. Dimble at the factory. She would fret about her playing and chatter nervously about her insecurities. I'll be up against students from the finest families in England, she complained, and I don't even have a decent dress to wear. That's a shame, isn't it, Mrs. McRae commented dryly. Lisa realized with remorse how frivolous she must sound to the woman who had lost her husband in the war and tried to get to work with no further complaints. So it was with surprise that Lisa came to work the next morning and found a package tied with recycling string sitting on her chair. What's this? she asked. Several of the other ladies stood up and gathered around, saying nothing. Mrs. McRae looked up from her work with a mischievous grin, as if she didn't understand the question. So Lisa picked it up and unwrapped it carefully. She pulled out a beautiful dark blue dress. Mrs. McRae, you didn't. Stunned, Lisa held up the elegant new dress and the ladies around her clapped. Very fancy that is, Mrs. McRae, a co-worker said. Next thing you know, you'll be seamstress to the queen. Mrs. McRae smiled proudly. That'll impress him, I hope. Oh, thank you, thank you, Lisa threw her arms around the woman. The Saturday before the audition, Lisa was practicing alone in the cellar when she heard a familiar whistling coming up from the kitchen. It was the Grieg. She leapt up. Could it be? Had Aaron miraculously come back to wish her luck? She ran to the top of the stairs only to find Gunter. She tried to hide her disappointment as he laughed at her confusion and handed her a letter from Aaron. She tore open the letter and raced quickly through his words. Aaron was uncharacteristically positive and convinced that he would be released soon. He urged her on. Know that I love you and concentrate on the audition. I'll be thinking of you every moment. She reread the last line a second time, filled with joy, and then threw herself with added fervor back into the Beethoven. On the day of her audition, Lisa was surprised to see Gunter waiting on the sidewalk. I'm going with you, he said cheerfully. The hat factory has given me the day off. Gunter, you don't have to. I'll be fine. Of course I do, he said. I'm going to quiz you on the way. As they rode the train, Gunter thumbed through the pages of the textbook, lobbing question after question. Lisa hadn't really felt nervous until they arrived at the entrance of the Royal Academy of Music. She was once again overwhelmed by the grandeur of the building. She saw the large group of well-dressed English teenagers and their parents and felt the bottom drop out of her stomach. She could feel the atmosphere of intense competition enveloping the courtyard. She had known she would be up against a number of young and talented musicians, but she hadn't imagined how many. The boys looked cool and confident. The girls wore simple, elegant black dresses and emitted a collective glow of beauty and confidence. But what made Lisa feel most apart from others wasn't the fact that she had on a blue dress and not a black one. It was that she was the only aspiring artist 
in line on this important day who wasn't accompanied by her parents. Don't worry, Mama, she said silently. I know you're here. Lisa and 20 other students were taken to a small classroom on the third floor where she was handed a pencil and a test booklet and told that she had one hour to complete the music theory portion of the exam. The pages were filled with endless questions. Nervous that she was spending too much time on each, she began to speed through them in a flurry. There were questions she couldn't answer, but then there were many that she could, and she alternated between the feeling she was doing brilliantly and the fear that she was failing miserably. She answered the questions so fast that she finished the exam early, but felt too scared to go back and check things, afraid she would get confused. Pencils down, the monitor said finally. Then Lisa was taken to a practice room with an upright piano where she was tested on pitch and solfeggios by a serious young man. She sang the intervals as asked and did her best to name the notes as the man struck them on the keyboard. Thank you, he said when it was over, not giving any hint of how she had done. Please wait in the hallway outside the auditorium on the first floor. A young woman with a clipboard came by and told Lisa that she would be sixth in line for the performance section of the audition. She was relieved to know the order. At least she wouldn't have her heart in her throat each time the auditorium door swung open and a new student was called. When the woman with the clipboard called out her name, Lisa stood up as proudly as she could, disguising the sudden pounding of her heart and walked through the double doors. Her knees were weak as she walked down the corridor of the cavernous auditorium toward the stage where a beautiful Steinway grand piano stood waiting. In the tenth row of the otherwise empty hall, three judges sat with impassive expressions. She climbed the stairs, walked over to the piano, and bowed to the judges. She had planned to begin with the ballad in order to dazzle them from the beginning, but with the pounding of her heart terrorizing her so, she decided to switch to the Beethoven. Maybe the steady march of the opening chords would calm her down. What would you like to play first, the male judge on the left called out. Beethoven's Piano Sonata in C minor, opus 13, number 8. The patique, the other man said, jotting down a note in the book in front of him. She adjusted her weight on the piano bench, tested the pedals quickly to judge their spring, took a deep breath and began. The opening notes of the sonata were solemn, the tempo measured and deliberate. For Lisa, it was as heartfelt as the lighting of the candles on her parents' master mantelpiece. She saw the care in her mother's hands as she kindled the flame of the Shabbat, and relived the warmth of the glowing dining room and the harmonies of the dramatic chords. Her hands flew lightly into the trills and arpeggios, speeding up and down the keyboard. She imagined the energy was like the preparations for the Sabbath meal. She saw the playfulness of her sister Sonia scurrying in and out with plates. How fast she went on her excited little legs as the high notes tinkled and twirled through the acoustical perfection of the hall. In the majestic simplicity of the notes, Lisa's hand searched for just the right touch to convey the poignant melancholy that lay within her. Thank you, she heard between the notes near the end of the first movement. She suddenly realized the judges had let her go on for ten whole minutes. Perhaps you could play your prelude and fugue next. She wanted to say, no, no, you must hear the Chopin. But she bowed graciously and begins, box fugue in D minor. She thought she was doing pretty well when a woman's thin voice pierced her concentration. Thank you, said the small lady in the dark suit. And what have you prepared from the romantic period? I will play Chopin's ballade in G minor, opus 23, number one. As with the Beethoven, the Chopin opened slowly and majestically, but then Chopin opened Lisa's heart with his romantic interlaced melodies. Here was a composer who reached into the farthest recesses of Lisa's soul and stirred her deepest yearnings. Lisa's mother had told her that in this ballad, Chopin was crying for the loss of his native Poland at having to flee war and destruction, never to return. It was a tribute to his lost homeland. Lisa's fingers sang her own nostalgic tribute to Vienna, 
now lost to her, and to her parents and Rosie, and even Sonia, so far from her. She laid her heart bare as her fingers moved almost with no conscious effort. Lisa's strong but delicate fingers raced up and down the keyboard as she expressed the passionate yearnings for her future life. Her growing feelings for Aaron, her prayer for Johnny's recovery, and her belief in the beauty of a world someday without war. Another thank you broke her reverie, and she realized with alarm that she had played the entire piece without being interrupted. Maybe they had tried to stop her, and she hadn't heard them. She raised her head and looked out. The male judges were writing in their books, and the tiny woman nodded her head politely. She scoured their faces for a reaction, but found none. That is all, you may go, was all she got by way of response, so she bowed politely and walked off the stage. Gunter was waiting in the hallway. How was it? How did you do? He asked, anxious for the news. I did everything I could. I gave it my all. We all did, Gunter.